Lawrence Baptist Church is now live. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see everybody in Sunday school today. And we're going to have a great Sunday school lesson. We're going to be uh, doing this remotely. Dana's running the uh, live stream right now. And I'm so glad that he's able to do that from home. And it's going to be a, a great morning in Sunday school. We got a lot to praise the Lord about. I'll tell you what, we've had a great week this week. We've had um, um, had um, one saved yesterday, which was good. And uh, I'll tell you what, it's, it's been a great weekend. And we um, had our super, 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 super men's breakfast yesterday. And uh, that was great. We, uh, I, I just love our men's breakfast where we can gather around God's word and uh, also gather around for prayer. And we had some really good prayer requests that we had yesterday. And, and we prayed and we um, just had a really good time of that. But it's good to see the ones who are here today and those of you who are tuned in. It's good to have you live streaming. And uh, so... Before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for today. We thank you for all that you've done for us. I pray now that you'll guide and direct in the Sunday school lesson. We pray we may get something out of it and that we can take and use it in our own lives. We know that your word is, is important and it will never return void unto us. We pray that everything that we do and say will be for your honor and your glory. We love you. Thank you for what you've done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Okay. So let's take and um, turn in your Bibles, if you will, to First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two. This is kind of a a different um, Sunday school lesson today, in that we're going to be looking at some things that most preachers sometimes will sidestep, including myself. And uh, we're going to be hitting it head on today uh, because I feel it's important for us to look at. And um, so it's going to be a really, really good um, Sunday school lesson. So if you turn your Bibles to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, if I can find it, we'll be in good shape. I know it's in this Bible somewhere. It really is. There it is. 1 Timothy chapter 2. The uh, First Timothy chapter two has an awful lot of things in it, and um, we're going to take and um, uh, we're going to be looking at at a lot of this this morning, and um, we're only going to be covering a couple of verses, just verses nine and ten, because there's an awful lot in verses nine and ten that I feel that we need to uh, to to look at. But um, starting at verse number nine, uh, we'll be reading verses nine and ten here real quick. It says. In like manner, also women adorn themselves in modest apparel with uh, shamefacedness and so sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. If we take and we look back at the previous eight verses, uh, which we studied in the last couple weeks, you'll see that Paul was talking uh, to men. Uh, if you look at, um, at verse 1, it says that, um, that he gives thanks uh, for, for all men, um, for the uh, kings and all are, are in authority. We need to take and remember that he's talking to men and saying that they need to have uh, uh, look to those who have authority. Um, verse 4, it says, who will have all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of, their, of uh, the truth. Uh, it was uh, God's desire that all men uh, would be saved, that uh, none would uh, uh, have to go to hell. Um, and then if you go on down there, we'll see that we have uh, one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Um, and we talked about that in length. If you go down to verse 7, it says, Where am I am ordained to preach? Uh, and an apostle, Paul, is giving his authority once again. And then in verse 8, we saw last week, I will therefore that men pray everywhere, uh, lifting up holy hands. And so here we see that, that in the first eight verses, Paul covered a lot of things 
for men. And uh, now in uh, the next couple of verses, we see that he's shifting gears a little bit, and he's talking to women. And, um, um, you know, this is what we're going to be looking at today is, is um, has been a difficult subject for many years. And, I mean, there's a lot of preachers who will sidestep this issue, but because it's in the Bible, we need to take and we need to look at it. Um, let's take a look here at, at what Paul is saying. He says, in like manner also. Paul wants uh, his readers to realize what he's about to uh, talk about uh, is for uh, someone who was not necessarily mentioned in the previous verses. And that's what he's saying here. He says, I want you to listen to what I'm about to say because if it didn't pertain to you in the first eight verses, I guarantee it's, gonna, it's going to pertain to you in the next verses. And that's what, he, what he's saying here. Now, um, Paul, um, however, the, the ones that he's about to mention, he wanted them to uh, take uh, note of exactly what he was going to say. And he wants them to realize that it's not for the men, uh, but also for the women. He wants everyone to realize that what he's writing is for everybody, not necessarily just for the men. Now, he goes on to say that women adorn themselves in modest apparel. You know, um, in the days of the Grecians, uh, or in the days of Paul, there were... Um, there was not a whole lot of difference, actually, in the styles of dress. However, there was a different way to wear the styles that they had. Now, women back then, how did they uh, have their how did they have their dress? Okay, they had long dresses. Now, uh, much of this was one piece of material or two pieces of material that was um, uh, sewn in the, you know, down up the, up the seams in the side. Now, um, and it was very, uh, most of it was very modest around the neckline and, and things like that. And uh, most women's garments uh, were, um, you know, the, they had sleeves on them. They had a lot of uh, um, decorative uh, things on a woman's where the men didn't. And so what we need to realize is that there was a distinct difference between what the women wore and what the men wore. Now, what did the men wear? Okay, they had, they had a long robe type of garment where it would take and come and it would have a, a tie in the front and things like that. Now, there was a distinct difference between the men and the women's wear. What was it? What's that? Um, yeah, the men's uh, uh, came down farther. The women's was very modest. It came up to their neck uh, uh, in the early days. Uh, and we're going to be looking at this uh, as we get through here a little bit. But most, most women's garments, uh, it goes on to say that women uh, adorn themselves in modest apparel. Uh, and what we need to realize is that most women's garments uh, were long and the sides were, were sewn up. Uh, but, and uh, there was a... Um, hole cut in the top for their head to go through, and they were very modest. They came up to their neck, or almost up to their chin. They had nothing in their chest exposed. <laughs> Everybody's pulling their skirts up. Anyway, um, um, but, um, you know, where the modest part comes in, believe it or not, was the hemline. It was the hemline where the, the, uh, um, where the modesty came in. And what Paul is saying here is that women needed to dress in modest apparel. Now, what a lot of women would do is where the hemline on the side was, they would leave it unslit above the knee so that as they walked, their calves would show, you know, or the lower leg would show. And, uh, um, you know, we may think that's funny now, but uh, it was the women of the night that did that. And, I mean, you know, uh, and it was a woman who was looking for a husband. You know, they would walk around, you know, with their, with their calves showing, you know, much like this here. You know, they would have, uh, they would have their calves showing. Yes, exactly. 
and it, it showed that they were available for something. And uh, uh, so what, what Paul is saying here is that women need to take and dress appropriately when they're out in, in public. Now, um, many younger women would slit the, uh, it up and sometimes even higher than that just to show the men that they were looking for a husband. You know, <clears throat> it was considered immodest in the day of Paul for a woman to show any part of her flesh. I mean, yeah, their arms had to be covered. Their neckline had to be covered. Their legs had to be covered, all the way down to their ankles. In fact, there was a lot of uh, women who uh, had um, wider bottoms in their skirts so that you couldn't even see their sandals as they walked. Uh, but they, they were not supposed to show any type of flesh whatsoever. And, uh, and this is what Paul is talking about to women. He says, you need to take and realize that you need to uh, uh, dress that way. You know, as time went on, you know, there were different styles of dress uh, that came and, and went. Now, uh, the Roman women uh, had some of the most provocative uh, dress of all times. It was during uh, that the time of Nero uh, when the women showed their, their bust lines, you know, and when they had real low cut uh, tops and things like that. But it was not until the time of Nero uh, that this all came in. Uh, women always had their um, um, the necklines all the way up to their neck and up until that point. And so here we see that, that Paul is saying that, that women need to take and dress. You know, many uh, women dress to arouse the opposite sex and to uh, put all the attention on their bodies instead of uh, bringing the attention uh, to the uh, one uh, who should have the attention, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, Paul is telling the women that they need to dress in a way which would be honoring to God, not bringing attention to themselves. And you know, if you take and you uh, look at even today, you know, um, there's a lot of women who do not dress appropriately. You know what I mean? Just go to Walmart and you can see that. But, uh, but he, he goes on to say, with uh, shame, faith, uh, faithness, and sobriety. You know, a woman does not need... Uh, this is talking about um, the things they put on as far as makeup and things like that. You know, a woman does not need to put on makeup with a putty knife. You know, they don't. I mean, you know, and I've seen it, you've seen it. And it, the only nice thing about living in Arizona is where it's hot and people sweat and their, their makeup just kind of runs off their face. You know, they kind of look like they're having a conniption. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, conniption is where your skin just kind of slides off your, your uh, face in that way. But, you know, uh, many, um, but here we see that uh, um, many times a little makeup uh, can go a long ways. You know, you know I look at girls in, the, uh, in our, our school, and I mean, there's not one of them that needs makeup. Not one of them. They all have beautiful faces. And, uh, uh, and I feel that many times... They take and put makeup on to try to make themselves look like something they're not. And, uh, um, and I, I just feel that natural beauty is the way God intended things. You know, uh, make yourself presentable uh, to glorify God, not to bring attention to others. You know, um, harlots and whores painted themselves up to entice the opposite sex. And that's what they did. You know, if you take and you look at pictures of, you know, back in, in the days of Paul and things like that, you'll see that the women back there uh, would take and they would paint themselves up and uh, try to entice men to um, um, come to them and, and things like that. If you go into the book of, um, of um, uh, Proverbs and you read what um, Solomon says about women of the night, you'll see that's what they did is they... They would dress themselves up. They would put on makeup and things like that to show what they were and what they were selling. Um, you know, a godly woman um, would put on, should only put on enough makeup to bring honor uh, to her husband and not to bring attention to herself. You know, godly women uh, should make themselves look the part 
of being a godly woman. You know, Hollywood, I believe, has ruined the appearance of women. I really believe that. You know, oh, I have to look like that, so I'm going to starve myself so that I can be in a double zero. Or I'm going to starve myself to be in a zero, or whatever. And I'm going to, I want to take and I want to look like this. So I'm going to take as much makeup on as I can and just smear it all over my face and put on eyeliner four inches thick. And uh, then I'll take and I will, uh, I'll be able to take and look like uh, uh, the Hollywood um, crowd. And, and what we need to realize is I believe that, that Hollywood has really um, hurt the beauty of the women today. You know, most women don't need a lot of makeup. Uh, to make themselves look beautiful. You know, there may be a few uh, who even a putty knife with makeup won't help, you know. Um, but <laughs> now, I, I didn't even look at you, Serena. No, I didn't. And, uh, but, you know, I, um, <laughs> as I was doing this, I got to thinking about um, if, you, if you go into... Uh, um, you know, many preachers, you will take and they'll look at this and they'll say, well, you know, um, there's an awful lot of women who have over the years tried to make themselves look like something they really aren't. And I, I don't get me wrong when I say this, but um, uh, Mrs. Krauss, you know, she was on TVN for years and uh, Tammy Faye Baker, you know, um, I mean, you know, they would take, and, and if anybody put makeup on with a putty knife, it was them. Yeah. I mean, it was just unbelievable. But anyway, um, and, and it took the beauty away from them. It did. You know, they wanted to make themselves look like a Hollywood starlet, when in essence, all they did is make themselves look like a cheap whore. I hate to put it that way, but that's what they did. And I believe that many times that, that um, women who... Uh, put on too much makeup and things like that, and that's exactly what they bring themselves. But what is godly apparel which pertaineth to a woman? Um, you know, over the years, I have heard message after message uh, given how women should not wear pants. You know, I have a preference that uh, women should uh, wear skirts or dresses, and, and many a preacher has used the verses in Exodus and Leviticus how only women are to uh, uh, wear, uh, or how women are not to wear breeches, only men are. Uh, however, if you take and you look at those verses, you'll see that the verses that it's talking about is only pertaining to the priests and the high priests. You know, if you remember our study in Exodus, um, God said that uh, he wanted breeches or breeches on the priests to cover their nakedness. What that meant is they had to put on uh, breeches that came down to their knees and, and up, and they were to be linen. Now, uh, to me, that's underwear. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but that, to me, that's what that is. Now, but there's many uh, a, a preacher that have used that, and I heard preacher after preacher after preacher as I was growing up use those verses that it showed that women are not to wear pants, that they are only supposed to wear dresses, and men are the ones who are supposed to wear the pants in the family. Now, I don't agree 100% with what they say. Um, now, if you take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 22 and verse 5, uh, that verse there, it says, <clears throat> The women shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination to the Lord thy God. Now, God was very explicit under the law about cross-dressing. Um, you may say, well, preacher, that's all under the law, and I realize that. However, what is the law for? A guidance or a schoolmaster. And what do we learn from a schoolmaster? We learn things that we should do or things that we should carry over. Now, um, as I was going through this, I got to thinking about this, and I thought, well, um, what exactly is this talking about? What is it? What is 
a woman's and what is a man's apparel. You know, in the Old Testament time, if you look at most of the men's dress, uh, they had a robe on, and they had, um, and the color of their, their, um, their dress was different than what a woman's was. You know, what was the difference in the material between a man and a woman's um, dress back in that time period? Does anybody know? Well, okay, most women's was silk or, or a very fine material. I mean, you could see through it, and that's why they put layers of, um, of clothes on. They would wear up to three layers of different uh, clothes as they, you know, dressed and things like that. Now, a man, a man was a little different. A man, he would have his robe on, and it was made out of different material than what a woman's was. A man's uh, robe was usually made out of um, animal skin, or it was woven out of uh, uh, like um, uh, sheep's uh, fr um, wool. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, sheep's wool, and uh, or or something like that. It was not the the real fine, uh, and um, a woman's was usually uh, textured to beauty. Uh, to bring out the beauty in the woman and to bring out the beauty in her clothes. Now, a man's, on the other hand, was just plain Jane, you know, brown, you know what I mean, black, you know, uh, and it was, they were more masculine colors than feminine. And a woman's dress was to be feminine, not masculine. And if you look at, at what the men wore, uh, most of them would put their robe on and they would have like a um, leather belt or something like that that would go around them. Uh, if you look at, uh, um, at um, um, uh, Isaiah, Isaiah wore a, uh, a, um, a girdle, so to speak, it was called, but it was a belt that went around him made out of leather. But what did he all, uh, uh, what else did he wear? He wore camel's hair. Um, his his attire was that. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't really think I would want to put on a robe every day of camels here. I think it'd be hot. I think it would smell and everything else, but that's what the Bible says he wore. So what we see is that there was a difference between what the women wore and what the men wore. And this is what Paul is talking about here. He says that, you know, uh, that a woman will dress like a woman in beautiful clothes, in, in something that pertaineth to her. And then, um, and then um, in Deuteronomy, we see that, that uh, under the law, it was forbidden for a man to take and wear that which pertaineth to a woman. Now, um, if you look at, at much of the, um, um, the clothing that was back in that day, uh, there was a lot of it that was even made out of sackcloth. You know, uh, especially for the man, because uh, it was durable. It was, if they would have had denim in that day, that's what men would have had because it was durable. You know, men wore clothes that wouldn't wear out. You know, it's much like a farmer, you know, uh, today. You know, they'll wear blue jeans. They'll wear, they'll wear clothes that don't wear out, that just keep on going. And so that's what Paul is talking about here a little bit. And then he goes on to say, not with uh, bro um, uh, broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. You know, broided hair, the best way I can explain this, how many of you remember, oh, back in the 50s and 60s, the beehives? Huh? The beehives, you know, up on, up on the head? You remember those? Well, you know, uh, I think that's the only way I can think about this. And uh, in the days of the Grecians, you know, women would uh, uh, spend hours and hours um, working on their hair, trying to make sure every hair was exactly where it should be. You know, many would weave um, golden thread into their hair. They would take and they would put gold and silver and they would weave that into their hair. Say, for instance, you were going to do a, uh, a ponytail like like uh, Susan has on today, or, or Serena, and they would actually take and they would start at the head 
and they would come in and they would weave in that, they would weave gold and silver just to make it glisten or make it look more royal or make them look uh, better. Now they, now they sew in hair. Yeah, now they just take and dye their hair purple or pink or... Yeah. Oh, yeah. So anyway, but, but what this is talking about is that, that uh, they aren't to take and, and uh, uh, worry about that. You know, the, uh, uh, the only two women that I can you know, re really think about that would fit this is Tammy Faye Baker and Mrs. Krause. Because if you remember Tammy Faye Baker, when she was, you know, I mean, her hair was, you know, and... What's that? I have no idea how they opened their eyes. I don't either. I mean, her eyelids were, or um, eyelashes were about a foot long. And anyway, but it just, um, um, and that's, that's what Paul, I believe, is talking about here. And when, I, and when I read this, I'm thinking to myself, man alive, how could uh, Jim Baker and how could uh, Kraus both look at their wives and say, hey, wait a minute, you guys are not godly women. You're not doing what the Bible says. You're trying to bring attention to yourself rather than bringing the attention to God. And now, um, you know, what we need to realize is this, is that, that many times back in the days of Paul, when women would do this, all they did it for was to bring attention to them so that they could sell themselves in the marketplace. You know, many of them were... Um, women of the night, so to speak. Many of them were the ones that, that uh, portrayed themselves as business women. Uh, you know, Paul is telling uh, the women not to put on, uh, or not to put so much time into themselves, but to put more time into the honor and glory of the Lord and his work. You know, many women would uh, have dresses made with gold and silver and precious stones and and they'd be weaved into the dresses, making them uh, look like uh, they were very high society. And many women were. But many of these dresses uh, could cost a lot of money, which could have been used for the Lord's work. You know, Paul wanted them to realize it was not how they dressed or how much uh, they spent on a dress that counted for the Lord. But it was what they did for the Lord that counted the most. You know, even though God wants us to dress um, nice and to look our best, it does not impress him whatsoever. You know, um, even though, you know, I wear a suit on Sunday morning and, and things like that, I mean, does this impress God? I don't think so. You know, does it impress God that, uh, you know, we um, look the way we do? Does it impress God if you put on your Make up with a putty knife? I don't think so. You know, I, I think what impresses God is the inner beauty of a person, not the outward beauty. You know, um, you know clothes are the outward appearance, uh, and uh, uh, God does not look on the outward appearance of us. God looks on the inward appearance. But then it goes on to say, but um, which becometh, but which becometh woman professing godliness with good works. Now, if you look at that, um, which becometh uh, women um, professing godliness, you notice that that's in what? Parentheses. Parentheses. That means that it was added in. That means that, uh, that that part of that verse was added in. That verse could read, but with good works. Now, um, the which becometh women professing godliness was placed in there. And the verse uh, could read, but uh, with good works. Now, God does not want to see how high and mighty we feel we are. He wants to see how lowly and how uh, humble we are before him. You know, um, as I was uh, getting ready for um, this morning, I got up about 4.30 and I um, went out. Well, Max decided he needed to go outside, so I thought, I'm going to go outside. It was nice and cool out there this morning, so I took my Bible out, and I was reading outside and, and stuff, and I was praying. And, and I asked God, I said, I want you to take, and I want you to give me the words that everybody can understand exactly what I'm trying to get across. 
And, you know, God would rather see us go to a thrift store many times and buy clothes than he would for us to go to Fifth Avenue and pick up real expensive, quote, unquote, the best there is um, out there to buy. You know, how much money do we throw away buying costly array and we rob God because we're broke after we go shopping? You know, God doesn't care how we look as much as what or how we're serving him. You know, um, forget the clothes, the hair, the nails, the jewelry, and, uh, and the makeup, and remember, but with good works. But with good works. You know, uh, if all of us would take and remember that, if all of us would remember that God wants us to be obedient, that he wants us to do his will in our lives, and not the way we look, and not the way we appear to present ourselves, if we only would realize that God wants good works out of us and to do what he wants us to do, uh, what he's called us to do, we would have a lot better and a lot more fulfilled life. And uh, so what we need to realize is this, is that Paul is saying here, I want you to realize that, that uh, it's not what you wear, it's not what you put on. It's not your outward appearance that's going to appeal to God, but it's your inward man. You know, how are you inside? What kind of a life are you living? Are you living what you're preaching? Are you uh, uh, doing exactly you know, what God wants you to do? You know, uh, forget the clothes, you know, forget the makeup, forget the nails, you know, I'll be honest with you, there's an awful lot of people that spend a whole lot of money on nails, pedicures, stuff like that. You, you, know, you understand what I mean? I don't know what a pedicure costs, but I know it's a lot. And uh, I don't know what it costs to have fake nails put on, but I know it's a lot. And, um, you know, God's not impressed with that. God says, well, you know what, I made you have fingernails. You know, I, I made you have toenails. And yeah, you've got to trim them once in a while, but you don't have to paint them all up. Amen. Um, but, you know, if, if you want to gussy yourself up for your husband or your wife, hey, go right ahead. Knock yourself out. Uh, you know, this is what God, I believe, wants us to do. I believe that God wants us to portray ourselves as godly men and women for our husband or our wife. You know, um, you know. You know, God likes obedience and, um, and the works that need to be done. He doesn't like laziness. God doesn't like laziness. And what we need to realize is when God has called us to do something, he expects us to get it done. And he expects us to do it in a fashion that he wants. I believe that men need to wear clothes uh, which make them look masculine. And I believe that women need to wear clothes which makes them look feminine or as the weaker vessel which God had intended for them to be. You know, um, this is one of my pet peeves and, and I don't care if anybody likes it or not. The thing that really, really bothers me is women that have their bodies covered in tattoos. I mean, there is nothing that bothers me more than that. And the reason I say that is that God made a woman's body to be feminine and beautiful just the way it is. And why do you want to take and get it all tatted up? And, you know, I mean, I was in Starbucks this morning and picked up coffee and there was a woman in front of me and um, she had on a spaghetti strap uh, uh, shirt and way down, I mean, you know, I didn't look that close, but. The, her whole back was covered with tattoos. Her arms were covered with tattoos down to her. I mean, it was, it, it was gross. I hate to say it that way. It was. And uh, she just kept flaunting her tattoos around. And uh, so I got my coffee, and, and, um, and she looked at me as if to say, why aren't you going to say something about my tattoos? Well, I thought, well, okay, if she wants me to say something, I will. I don't care. You know, I said, you know, I said, You'd be a very beautiful woman if you didn't have all those tattoos. 
And that's just what I said. I turned around and walked away. And she looked at me, and if looks could have killed, I'd have been dead. I really would have. And uh, uh, so I, I walked out. But that's the way I felt. You know, she was all tatted up, and I'm thinking to myself, she took away her whole natural beauty, and she'll never be able to get it back, ever. You know, never will she be able to get that natural beauty back. And uh, um, am I against tattoos? No, I'm not against tattoos or anything like that. However, I do believe that people need to modestly think about it. And, uh, um, you know, I believe that, that God made women in a certain way, and God made men in a certain way. And men need to be men, and women need to be women. And so we just need to take and remember that God has made us all in his image, and we need to remember that, that uh, he will uh, take care of everything. But now, <clears throat> we're going to take and go to, uh, I got a little bit, I'm almost done. Um, but what we need, anybody got any questions at all? Yes, sir. Um, well, if you go into the law um, in the book of De Deuteronomy, or it's either Deuteronomy, yeah, I think it's Deuteronomy. I have to look it up. Hang on a minute. Um, it says that a, a person is not to make carvings uh, of himself. Um, hang on a minute. Let me see if I got it in here. Um, and, that, that, and what that is, is it's talking about tattoos. Um, because back in the days of... of well, all the way back till, you know, way, way back. No, I don't have it in here. Hmm? Is it in Leviticus? I don't know. It's either in Deuteronomy or Leviticus, one of the two of them. I don't have it in my index. But, um, but anyway, it talks about how that um, uh, people are not make carvings of animals or anything in the you know on their skin and basically that's what that is is tattoos all the way back into the um the ones that were real heavy into that were the egyptians believe it or not and when um the israel israelites were in egypt you know they got into the tattoos and they got into that yes sir leviticus 1921 Write that down. And uh, so, but anyway, that, that's what it talks about is um, having, let's go in there and see what we got. Nineteen twenty one. I'm getting there. What's that? Yeah, that's about right. 1928, yep. That's close. All right, 1928, here we go. It says, You shall not make any cuttings in your flesh for the dead, nor print any marks upon you. I am the Lord. What that's talking about there is tattoos, or you know, tattooing yourself, uh, making cuttings, and then what they would do is, back then they would make a cutting and then they would put ink in it, and that would you know, be the tattoo. Now, um, if you take and you look at that, you think, well, you know, okay, why? Well, God wanted us to keep our bodies pure. What is our, what is our body? The temple of the Holy Spirit. And so if we mar it up, we just mar up his temple. And uh, so we need to take and realize that, that we need to uh, be careful what we do with our bodies. All right, let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to start church in about 15 minutes. Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for your love. Thank you for all that you've done for us. I pray now that you'll guide and direct in the service to follow. I pray that you'll help us and guide us and be with us, I pray. I just thank you so much for the Sunday school lesson. Thank you now for um, giving us guidance as to how we need to take and dress and how we need to take and present ourselves to those who are around us. Father, I pray now that you'll guide and direct us in, in all that we do today. And we'll give the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All righty. Mm.